I moved to LA, Cinco de Mayo, 1974, and the party hasn't stopped since. Because tonight we're going to party like it's 1999. Hi, W Magazine. I'm Sandra Bernhard, and this is My Life in Parties. I was born in Flint, Michigan. I was always entertaining from the time I could first walk and talk. I always wanted to be a singer. I have three older brothers, so I was always you know, engaging them and entertaining them. They asked me, what do you want to be when you grow up? And I was five years old. I said, a comedian, an entertainer. It was second nature for me to be in the eye of the storm and, and, and I just loved the attention. My brothers, they, they would push them to be professionals, but by the time they got to me, there was, there was no doubt what I was gonna do. They were just like, okay, move to LA, give it a try. Move to LA, and that's where I started my illustrious career as a manicurist in Beverly Hills at 351 North Cannon. So I was completely self-sufficient. Took care of myself from that point on. I think anybody now, at that age, it would be impossible for somebody to make it. I knew I had to take care of myself with a day gig. I started performing at open mic nights around the city and was discovered by my mentor, Paul Mooney, and my soul sister, Lotus Weinstock. For Lotus Weinstock, comedy has been an emotionally rewarding experience, if not lucrative as well. I think there's got to be easier ways not to make a living. <laughs> the two of them shepherded me through the early parts of my career. And Paul Mooney first of all believed that I was gorgeous. He was always there as my brother, my father, my best friend. He always said, you're, someday you're gonna be a supermodel. And he just thought I was unique and fabulous. So that gave me a, the confidence that I'd never really had before. He also would always just say, listen, this business is rough and they're gonna put you through hell in a pair of kerosene drawers. You're a cigarette come to life. Bernhard. If he saw that I was like freaking out or depressed, he'd take me outside the comedy store, the improv, and he'd say, never let them see you crying, Bernhard. They want to break you down. They want to break your spirit, but don't let them. Back then in the 70s when, you know, being a, a female you know, performer doing comedy was so much more, you know, of a rarity. And also doing things that were not self-deprecating, post-feminist. That was something that was like very unnerving for an audience and other performers. So yeah, a lot of times it didn't go over, but every time you have a little fall, you get up and the next night, you're probably 10 times better than you ever were before. Paul Money was the, the head writer and producer for Pryor. He got me and, and Robin Williams and Marshall Warfield and uh, several performers who were just starting out to be part of the ensemble. That's how it came together. A gentleman by the name of Robin Williams. Robin, please. All I can say, though, is this man's a genius. Now, who else can take all the forms of comedy, slapstick, satire, mime, and stand-up, and turn it into something that'll offend everyone? <laughs> King of Comedy was, was a complete game changer for me. So that was certainly my big break, for 100%. You were schmucko supremo last Hold night. Hold on a minute, I'm the it. schmuck, me. Oh, You're wrong, really buddy. Crazy. You're very wrong. Yeah. When I auditioned for Sis Corman, who was the casting director, and said, I think Marty needs to see you. So the next day I, I came back to meet Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro. And they also came to see me perform that night so they could see how I was improvising. It was kind of a combination of what they were looking for. A new, brash, unexposed actor who was funny, kind of electrifying, and I got the part. It's Andre Leontali. I don't remember where I met him, when, or how. But to me, that's a sign of a great friendship when you just can't even remember the moment the magic happened. Andre was always connecting me with everybody in the business. And when he got behind you, of course, it was, you know, another incredible plateau and opportunity that opened up for me. Andre took me to meet Carl because I was over there doing his fashion show. We got to go into the store in Paris and he let me pick whatever I wanted. So I came home with like, you know, two giant suitcases of Chanel drag, and that was insane. Carl was an interesting character. Of course, he was German, and you couldn't understand a word he was saying. So you would just sit there, and he would just like ramble on in English, but I didn't know what the hell he was talking about. I would just like agree and laugh, and 
it was sort of a strange, fabulous experience. One of a kind, like all those bigger than life characters are in fashion. That is Isaac Mizrahi. I met Isaac in probably 1988, 89, because he had been on a talk show and somebody asked him, oh, who would you like to address? And I was one of the people he had mentioned. And I went in and I had a meeting with him and a fitting and, and we kind of took off from there. You know, we were just like kindred spirits. It was, he was really at his peak in, in design at that time. I would go to his atelier, his studio all the time and we'd hang out and we'd dance. And he gave me like m amazing clothes to wear. Um, and I wore a lot of his stuff on David Letterman. Sandra, that's that's, uh, that's a very dramatic uh, entrance you make there. Wasn't it? And that was a big game changer for me because I, I had never really had access to those kind of clothes before. When you saw people like Liza Minnelli and Barbara Streisand and all the great performers that I grew up admiring, that was the whole package, you know, somebody dressed them, somebody did their hair and makeup. Fortunately, I kind of, you know, I imagined it into reality. I'm just gonna sit and admire myself in a cocktail dress. <laughs> uh, Without You I'm Nothing was my first real, complete one woman show. Ain't no mountain high enough, ain't no valley low enough. Jimmy Swagger tried to fight the funk, he got funky on us. It was groundbreaking in the way that we covered almost every aspect of culture in a way nobody had ever done before. Expecting people to like rise to the occasion intellectually, emotionally, sexually, it kind of broke all the barriers. Everybody came to see it. The show was two hours long and it had music and it was like raucous and it was, it had every imaginable element that you can put into a, a, a one person show. It was, you know, a very celebrated and heralded show, and, and it really set me apart from all other kinds of performers and performances, and gave me a platform that I've continued to expand on for all the years since then. That's me and Robin Bird, and behind me is John Boscovich, who was my collaborator on Without You, I'm Nothing. And that was the opening night of the film version of Without You, I'm Nothing which was a huge success and a brilliant film and many people have emulated it, copied it, and that was another dress by Isaac Mizrahi. I met Madonna originally at Warren Beatty's house. She came up, she would come up with Sean uh, Penn and Warren would have screenings at his place with her Brits and all the models. He'd get first run films and we'd all sit around and she was very disinterested in me at that point. Um, she had no interest in being my friend. But suddenly in 1988, when I opened off Broadway, and without you, I'm nothing, she came around and we started hanging out. We were either at some party or some a record release for one of her records. From 1988, when I met her, until we stopped hanging out in 92, we were like constantly going places and dancing. And that was some of the, the most fun I ever had on the dance floor, obviously. With, with Madonna, you can't go wrong. I went to a party at my agent's house, Sue Mengers, who was like one of the great, one of the greatest agents, Hollywood agents of all times. And she would have these parties and everybody would come and you know, she'd mix people and, and Roseanne and Tom Arnold were there. About two weeks later, they called me and asked me if I'd come on and play Tom Arnold's um, fiance I came on initially to do that and then Roseanne wanted me to stay on the show and we decided I was gonna divorce Tom Arnold and then she'd become gay because he drove her into the arms of Morgan Fairchild. And Roseanne and I thought it'd be funny. The outcome was positive because people saw funny interesting characters you know doing things that they weren't familiar with so it sort of broke the ground. That picture was with Gianni Versace. I hung out with the Versaces. They were very, very nice. Donatella, it was always super fun and lovely. That was when I hosted the CFDA Awards, and that was a Gautier dress. Of course, Gautier is another person who I met through Andre. 
who was a super cool person. You know, that dress speaks for itself. It's just, it's magnificent. I've never worked with an ongoing stylist who, because I can pick up the phone and call anybody. Mark Jacobs dresses me. I get clothes from Norma Kamali. It's kind of nobody I can't at least borrow clothes from. That was when I did my one of my one woman shows. It was a big night at Town Hall here in New York City and I had several guest performers and Liza came out and sang with me, which was, I mean, what can you say? The thrill of a lifetime. Oh yes, that's my daughter, Cicely, when she was much, much younger. She's almost 25, my, my darling child. And that is my beloved love of my life, Sarah Switzer. We've been together for almost 24 years and she's an incredible person, brilliant, fabulous. We Sometimes we write together. She's changed the whole landscape of my life, so and she's gorgeous. Thank you so much, W Magazine. It's been so much fun having this little deep dive into my life. We'll see you next time.